In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on Tactics. Chaplain's Report today continues our series on the book of Daniel. And just to help you understand and remember where we left off in this story, so the Chaldeans, the magicians that were the advisors to the king, have basically been favored over by people that helped Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are all individuals that were there and got promoted because Daniel helped interpret the king's dream. Now, where is David in this particular episode? We don't really know. He's not really talked about. So we assume he's off somewhere else or whatever. But this is what happens. So they have gone and told the king that even though the king gave the order, that every time that you are to hear the music, you're supposed to bow down to this giant golden idol that I've made and worship it. The advisors noticed, or sorry, the uh, the Chaldeans noticed that his advisors, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to bow down and did not worship when the music played. And so here, in Daniel three thirteen through fifteen, is the result of that exchange. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men who were brought before the king, Nebuchadnezzar responded to them. Oh, I forgot to put my graphic up. Nebuchadnezzar then responded to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? And then they respond in verse 15. Or, sorry, in verse 15. Now, if you're ready at the moment, hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, and the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and to worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there that can deliver you from my hand? Very good question. And the king, I think, probably is pretty reasonable in his own eyes. Like, he really likes these advisors. He favors them. The reason that they are in the position that they're in is because he trusts them and he thinks that they're pretty good guys. And yet he hears from these other magicians, hey, those advisors that you appointed over us, they're not even bowing down and worshiping like you told them to. And so the king goes over there and talks to these three and says, uh, did this really happen? You have a chance to explain yourself. I'm going to give you a chance to explain why you did this. And by the way, if you go ahead and, and worship this time, this next time that we're going through, we'll just kind of forget that incident of you not worshiping and i'm giving you a second chance here even though i said originally that everybody that didn't worship is going to be cast into the furnace i'm going to give you a second chance and as long as you bow down and do what i say this time then it'll all be right all will be forgiven so in the king's mind he's probably being pretty reasonable he's probably being a lot more merciful towards these guys and showing a lot more favor to them than he would the average person and so the king does this but you know how the story ends and they decide not to do it. Because here's the thing. This was not a passing fancy for them. This is not something that they just on a whim said, maybe we won't get caught and we just won't have to worship. And so we'll just stand up. No, they knew what was going to happen. They knew they were going to get caught. They knew they were going to be punished. They understood that. And yet, despite that knowledge, these three young men decided, doesn't matter. We're not going to worship another God. The law of Moses says this is wrong. There is one God and one God only, and we are only supposed to worship him. And so when somebody tells us to bow down and worship an idol, we say no. We are not going to do this. This is against God's will. This is against his commandments to us, and we are not going to do it. And so the king shows up and says, oh, well, you know, they must have misunderstood me, or they didn't think that I was serious. Well, I'm telling you now, if you don't do it this next time, you're going to be casting the fiery furnace, you're going to be cast in this big blazing furnace. And so you have a second chance to capitulate and sin against your God and worship this idol. 
And once that happens, I'll be forgiven. Now, the human mind has an unfortunate tendency to rationalize its sin. And in this particular case, it would not have been hard for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego if they did not have this spiritual strength and fortitude to say, well, you know, we're in a position of power right here, and there are people that are hearing about God for the first time because we're in this position of influence. And so what we're going to do now is, yeah, I mean, we may have to kind of act like we're worshiping and pretending, but we won't really worship, and we'll just do it to go along, to get along, and to stay in the position we are. And that's what God would really want anyway. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. That is not the way somebody of faith acts. And because they knew that and understood that, they took a stand. A stand that they knew could very well result in their death. But then the king comes back and offers a second time if you do it this time. Don't you know how easy it would be to rationalize it the second time? Because at this point, they know they're going to get caught. Because the king's going to be paying attention. And they've really already been caught the first time. But he's giving them a second chance to rationalize and say, well, you know, the king is being pretty rational and he's going to let us do this a second time. And they still say no. It is more important to us to follow God's will than it is to stay alive. If we have to pick between preserving our life and not being cast into a furnace to be burned alive and disobeying God, we find the disobeying God to be more objectionable than losing our life by being burned to death. That's how strong their faith was. And they did not rationalize obeying another god or bowing down to an idol. You see, the last part of this is to me the most ironic. Because King Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 15, and you'll notice, what god is there that can deliver you out of my hands? In other words, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't even believe a god can save them. He doesn't believe that their god, which he is aware of, because keep in mind, he's already had Daniel tell him about this god and interpret his dream for him. He's looking at these three guys and says, yeah, just so you know, your god is not going to deliver you from this furnace. No god can save you. I am more powerful than any god you can come up with, and I have the power to throw you in a furnace, and so no god is going to stop me from doing this. And of course, that is ironic because we all know how this story eventually turns out. But the moral in all of this is that real moral conviction, it takes willpower and it takes planning. These young guys made a plan ahead of time. We are not going to disobey our God. And because of that, when they were presented with an opportunity to do so, even though it would have been easier for them to do so from a physical standpoint, They said, nope, it's still wrong. They had this planned ahead of time, and they had the willpower and the strength of mind and of spirit to continue to say no to sin, even when it kept knocking at their door a second time. And that's really what it takes. Sometimes, in fact, usually, sin is not a one-off thing. It keeps coming back and coming back and coming back and giving us more opportunities and more opportunities and more opportunities to rebel against God. But if we're going to be people of faith and we're going to be people that actually do have some conviction and some willpower, in in other words, what God commands of us and what he expects out of us, then we have to have the strength of will and the love for God ourselves to look at that offering and say, nope, obeying God is just that important to me. That's the kind of lives that we as Christians are supposed to live. Stay the course, friends. This is normally the part of the video where I tell you to go ahead and like and subscribe, but the truth is, I really don't care whether you do or not. I mean, it's not like you really need all the latest news and commentary from me. It's not like there's a lot of really important stuff going on in the world and in the state of Alabama right now that you should probably be aware of. So, you know what? Like and subscribe, or don't. I don't really care. Reverse psychology. Boom.